Oh. Hey guys, sorry, just getting you in the right place. I realised that I'd forgotten to put you up on uh, up on the platform. Hopefully, I won't knock you off in my excitement. Well, here I am in my very glamorous hotel room. It's actually quite cute, but it's not it's not very bright and cheery. It's dark here in Sydney already. Gosh, it gets dark here in Sydney early. You must be further north and further east than we are on the Mornington Peninsula. Hmm. <laughs> Good to see you all. Welcome, welcome. Now, uh, hello, Craig won the Craig won the comments um, race again. Hello, Cody. How are you going, John? Uh, no bonus points. Just go. I know. Every, at wash round and seasons quince paste. That will be delicious. Well. Possibly even better than the eggy pasta. I hope there are some people with eggy pasta. I'm also hoping that the internet doesn't let us down here because um, I always get nervous, uh, as you know, when I'm um, not completely in control of things because I'm not at home. Uh, so let me know if there are any problems. Uh, let's get, I have this time, because last time I arrived, hello Sharpie and Rod, how are you going? Good to see you. Hello Daryl and Sue. Uh, I was starting to worry that I was going to be talking to myself tonight. Hello. Uh, it's a great dividing range. <laughs> Good cheese and, cheese, cheese and quince pasta as well. Oh, nice. Loans. Uh, is that uh, is that Leone or is that somebody else calling them? So, uh, loans, welcome to Drinks with Kate if you haven't been with us before. Um, Kay's got the carbonara. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's get into the wine. I have the wine. I've brought it with me. Woohoo! Uh, 2013 Pinot Gris. Leone, I thought that was you. <laughs> I just wasn't quite sure. <laughs> um, and I brought a camping cup today. This is one of those, um, it's Perspex, but it's a good quality, um, I think it's plum, or it might be Riedel, but I think it's plum. Uh, hello, Sarah, and all the tricks. Good to see you. Let's get this open. Um, and I'm glad I brought my camping wine glass because the uh, the room is lovely, but, again, the wine glass, at least there are some wine glasses in this room as compared to my last hotel that I um, broadcast from um, in Sydney. But uh, whee! it's a great – oh, thank you, Leone. It's a great dividing range. The sun sets the west of the mountains, making the coast darker. Aha! Thank you. I didn't. <laughs> I should have known that. Being a good Australian. Hello, Sue and Jeff. Ah, oh, Shell and Andrew are having creamy truffle pasta with garlic and parmesan. Woohoo! Um, so I have managed to gather together some pretty ordinary. Um, this is supposed to be triple cream brie from a local producer, but it's it's been out of the fridge for about half an hour and it's rock hard still. But I also got some Meredith goat's cheese, so that'll be nice, and some potato chips in case I get really desperate. Beautiful colour on this wine. Now, um, some of you have tasted this wine before. I think that every time I open it, I'm, I, I breathe a sigh of relief that we've got um, – a wine that's going to that keeps on giving because you know a lot of people assume that Pinot Gris uh, is a wine that needs to be drunk early. And as we've discussed previously in Drinks with Kate, when you make it well and grow it in the right place, then it is a great variety that can age very, very nicely. And this is a very good example of how it does. So, hello, Anne, lovely to see you got the pasta off the stove. I know it was a little bit mean of me giving you such a um, time specific uh pasta you know it's got to be hot so that it cooks the egg yolk and da -da -da. anyway i hope it'll be worth it i think it'll be delicious with this wine so cheers everyone let's have a little smell and a little taste so craig asked right right at the top if we should decant this wine i obviously didn't if you want to decant it then give it a quick decant before you um pour it into the glass but um i don't think it needs it it's still got years to go, hasn't it, Craig? It's got its 10 years, but I reckon it's I reckon it'll keep doing good things for quite a while. It's got this beautiful. Oh, Cody, your wine seems to have a slight blush. Mine, well, mine doesn't have a blush, but it is golden. So depending on what that maybe it's the sunset or the light that you're in that's giving it a little 
a little pinkish glow. Uh, it might be might be um, reflecting off my dress. <laughs> Dauphin double cream, delicious. Thank you, Anne. It could be yeah, exactly. Thank you, thank you, Craig. Could be my shirt that's um that's that's making your wine look pink. Mm. So, for those of you who haven't been here before, and for those of you who have, this wine looks different every single time we open it up, but it's always super exciting and super delicious. So, what are we seeing here? So, before I talk about what I'm seeing in the glass now, I'll just flashback again to 10 years ago, 2013. It was quite a warm year, but and and we got the fruit nice and ripe. Now you can see. Um, says Kate who's needs bifocals it's got a good 14% alcohol on it so it's nice and ripe um a dry pinot gris from 2013 a year like 2013 we could have left it on the vine for longer and we could have got it even riper but I think once you get past the sort of 14 14 and a half percent alcohol hello Alison good to see you glad you made it <laughs> hope the dog training went well <laughs> um uh, yeah, a wine like this needs to have enough ripeness to have this kind of this ability to um, have concentration of flavour and intensity. But if you let it go too far, then not only do you end up with either too much alcohol or having to make the decision about whether you stop the ferment early to have a little bit of residual sugar so that it's not all alcohol, which would make a, for a very different type of wine. Uh, and also, one of the things that I think is really important about Pinot Gris um, when it's at this sort of quality and when you want to age it is that the phenolics need to be ripe, but they can't be overdone. And you can often get wine um, made from very ripe Pinot Gris, and Gewürz Tremina does this a little bit as well, but Pinot Gris particularly, um, that can be quite heavy because of because the phenolics are too coarse now because it's a medium acid grape variety that's one of the reasons that people think that it's not going to age um and uh <laughs> hello zach and jack hannah's in the next room ah oh. <laughs> hi hannah <laughs> good good work good work working hi nareem and all the dyes good to see you you haven't missed much uh, I was just talking about phenolics in uh, Pinot Gris because uh, we rely on acid to allow um, wine styles like Riesling and um, and Hunter Semillon to age. The, the acid is the most important thing. And in a lot of Chardonnays as well, the acid levels are quite important to allow it to, to age. Pinot Gris is a medium acid variety, if you, particularly when you get it this ripe. Um, oh, Shell, you've gone the pine nuts. Oh, well, that's all right. Um, Aha, there you go, good. <laughs> good work, Cotty. Just turn on some more lights. Um, this sort of wine needs to have ripe and balanced phenolics as well as the right amount of acid and the right amount of flavour and concentration to be able to age well. When it was young, it was really, it was quite restrained. And the and the and this has been an issue for us with Pinot Gris because we've only been making Pinot Gris really since since for about 15 years at Muraduck. It's very dark out there. I've got the curtains closed because um, my window looks out onto a brick wall, so it's not a very beautiful view, sadly. <laughs> I have to go out of the hotel to see the views of Sydney. But um, it's, it's also very dark. <laughs> um, so, yes, when, this, when, when our Pinot Gris is, is young, it's very kind of um, folded in on itself. So there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of concentration of flavour, but the flavours are not very expressive when they're young. It takes quite a long time for the flavours to evolve. And as you can see with this one, 10-year-old Pinot Gris, um, from a ripe year, so it would have been quite, the fruit would have been relatively spicy already, even as a young wine, but quite restrained. Um, as a as a ten year old wine, you're getting all these amazing tropical fruit characters and richness to the nose. So um, it's quite hard to describe, except for delicious. I think there's a lot of you who have been um, been re surprised or surprised for the first time by this wine. Um, what have people been saying? 
Uh, and oh yes, and you said that was the nicest, nicest Pinot Gris you've had. And yeah, Cra that's right. Craig's point about it showing florals after ten years—it is amazing. And the florals are really quite, um, quite uh, elevated. So you've got a little bit of a um, little bit of rose petal. You've got a little bit of um, oh, that. That we and we talked about this, I think, last time we tasted this wine, possibly, or one of the older Pinot Gris. There's a perfume ingredient that people talk about as iris or orris root, and it's usually iris root, and it's got this kind of really earthy but floral kind of note to it, which I see in this wine. And it's one of the reasons that a lot of people don't like young, simple Pinot Gris because they go straight to the florals and they don't have anything else going on. They don't have the weight. They don't have the texture. And um, if some of you remember from uh, a couple of years ago, young David, the Englishman, who, hi, David, if you're watching, um, he does sometimes. Um, David, uh, I got him in to talk about Pinot Gris and he only told me once we were on air that he doesn't really like Pinot Gris because it reminds right, reminded him of his grandma's um, talc. Uh, in the in the bathroom so it does sometimes have those kind of those sort of musky um, jasmine-y kind of florals without any savories the lovely thing about this one is that it does have some florals but they're kind of more dark brooding um, exotic florals rather than kind of bright powdery talky kind of notes the fruit expression is also really interesting on this wine for me it's it's got a little bit of it's got a bit of tropical kind of um almost uh like a like a mango nectar or some sort of um I can't quite put my finger on what it is that I'm smelling but it's definitely it's definitely a sort of tropical note but it's it's a sort of aromatics that work really well with the creamy cheese and the eggy base dishes and if you've got a bit of smoky bacon in your carbonara or um it, or some nice smoked charcuteries or something like that works really really well with a wine like this jeff um has pointed out a slightly overripe overripe pineapple okay do you know what i was going to say something um that's a little bit controversial i think i'll say it because i feel like i'm in a pretty safe, <laughs> safe space with you guys um the thing I can smell here is almost the smell of durian and a lot of people find durian really unattractive as a smell and I think that because it's quite it's it's quite um it's not really intensely durian but there's just that slight kind of there's a little earthy slightly caramelized onion kind of ripe overripe pineapple note but it sort of all kind of works because there's this lovely sort of creamy, buttery kind of note as well. Um, I don't think I'm describing it very well, but I think that it, there is something um, intriguing and a little bit, a little bit tastes like heaven's mate, smell, smells like hell is durian for sure, Pete. And I find um, I actually, uh, I actually find durian quite challenging to eat as well because it leaves a kind of oniony taste in your mouth, which this wine certainly doesn't. But there's something about that sort of that sweet but savoury kind of, well, some people find it, I don't, Alison, I've never heard that it smells like vomit, but it doesn't smell, it, it smells very strong. Um, so it's kind of like uh, there's a lot of um, ingredients that perfumiers use in perfume that they just use tiny, tiny amounts and, the, and, and that tiny amount just gives a little bit of complexity Whereas the actual thing that if it was just that smell, then it would be completely overwhelming. I think that's what I'm trying to, I think we move away from durian now because I don't think I've got you there. But there's something tropical and earthy and slightly dark, brooding about the, the aromatics. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> one, person, one person got it. But there's that sort of cheesy, eggy kind of thing. But, you know, um, how do you market a wine like this? So, so Craig, we sort of don't. Yeah, obviously, I'll, obviously, Alison, not quite, not quite as safe as I thought. Maybe I was, maybe I walked in there bearing my soul a little bit too much at that stage. Um, Craig, this is a very good, this is a very good question that you're asking. How do you market a wine like this? Um, 
Craig says, I can't think people outside Celador and fans would get it. Now, it's a wine that we've also had that feeling about for quite a long time. And we've got a little bit of it that we put aside because we wanted to be able to explore how the wine ages um, because because people said, oh, Pinot Gris doesn't age, and I said, I don't think that's right. So we thought let's give it a go. We've probably got a little more aside than ideally you would put aside if you were just, you know, being very kind of um, careful about the the finances. <laughs> but I believed in this wine, so uh, so made the decision to put it a, put a bit aside. Also, back in twenty thirteen, I think this wine was selling for thirty five dollars a bottle, um, which people still thought was ridiculously expensive for Pinot Gris, and a lot of people still think that forty forty five dollars for a glass of, for a bottle of Pinot Gris is pretty crazy. But, Craig, I think showing this wine to you guys over the last few years a couple of times and drinking it myself with different foods and things, I think that the way that you sell it is through um, very specific channels, um, obviously to people like you who are open-minded to it, taste it with me, and, you know, you might decide you want to put a bit in the cellar so that you can have it you know you might fall in love with it it's a wine that I like to go back to sort of on a you know every now and again and treat myself with so that's one avenue that's pretty obvious cellar door we have it on tasting on and off and and sometimes people get it and sometimes people don't so it's quite tricky um but yes Zach and Jack you got you got there just before just before I I managed to say it but um showing it to really high-end restaurants who have an open-minded attitude to how the wines might ha how the wine might look um, has been a really good way of being a, a little this wine out there into the into the market. So um, in Melbourne, we've uh, we've shown it to a couple of couple of places. It's absolutely a cheese course dream, um, but we've had it on pour at Voudemont and at um, Society in. Uh, in Melbourne. Um, I still have to work on a, you know, a two or three places in Sydney, but you know, that's we've 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 shown it at a um at a couple of uh private club events where we've been able to serve it with cheese and people have been able to see how it works. So serving it with the right food um and a pasta like that. And I think this one really for me it, it really shows it's got a real kind of, um, it does for me what really high-end uh, northern Italian Pinot Grigios can do, which is that ability to age kind of slowly and elegantly. It was never really kind of super fruity to start off with. So the fruit characters that it develops are kind of um, evolved and evolving um, even even now as, as the wine sits in the glass. And so it works really well with sort of northern Italian style dishes like a pasta that's got sort of some yeah, some goat's cheese or some sheep's cheese and um, some egg that's cooked into the the egg kind of makes the makes the pasta kind of come together. Um, also, uh, dishes like cacio uh, cacio e pepe. So that's that's a pepper based uh, pepper and cheese based pasta sauce um, works really well with a wine like this because that. It also copes with the spiciness of pepper or chili. So, you know, putting it with something else, the Latin back in the day would have been absolutely perfect, Zach and Jack. Absolutely, probably not so good with your lax or Allison. No, but um, well done for giving that a go. I think that with a laxer, you maybe need something with maybe a little bit of sugar or a little bit. I don't know. Uh, is it okay? Or you haven't tried it yet with the laxer? Anyway, I, I do think that this sort of wine can go quite well with. Asian flavors, but I think you need to have um, something sort of creamy. That oh, Craig, that's a really good wine nerd drink too. Um, absolutely good, Alison. We'll, we'll hear from you later. Um, compare it to a great Shannon. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people don't get Shannons in Australia either. So um, just trying to get Australian wine drinkers to understand that, yes, white wine can age, first of all, because a lot of people don't believe that white wine can age at all, any type, any style. 
but then understanding that um, you know you've got these wines and a, and a really good Shannon um, will tend to be higher in acid than something like this, um, but a Pinot Gris like this does beautiful things um, and is is unusual for for people who aren't used to it. And I think you're right, bit of fat probably um, eat, eat and or <laughs> cheese and some and some pancetta in there, or yeah, something a bit of um fatty porky kind of flavor works very very well with this this as well i'm going to have a little bit of goat's cheese on a cracker because i think that would work quite well i got some found some meredith goat's cheese down at the local supermarket mm. and i think salty creamy Cheese flavors work so well with this wine. Um, if I'd if I if I'd been able to find some quince paste, I would have been absolutely in heaven. Because I think the other thing that's nice about this wine is that it copes with a little bit of sweetness in the same way that it copes with a little bit of chili, and kind of reflects that. So if you are having like um, if you're having cheese and you had some like some really lovely wild honey or even some truffled honey to drool over the top, um, would be also rather delicious. So having a play around and there is a sort of a slight kind of wild honey kind of um, lanolin-y, waxy kind of a note to this wine as well, which I think is pretty groovy. Zach and Jack, have you found the elixir of life? Tastes half its age. I think this is just, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, these wines uh, just generally get drunk way too young. And I, I feel like I'm on a little bit of a, a crusade to um, to get people to think about how these wines age and transform with cellar age. So being able to put some of this wine away and bring it out and show it to people is really um, pretty amazing. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Alison, you can't do Chenin Blanc at all. Well, Chenin Blanc, is, Chenin Blanc is a weird grape variety in the same way that Pinot Gris is a weird grape variety. Depending on where you grow it, when you pick it, how you make it, you can have a really vast array of different styles. Um, Chenin Blancs from Australia do tend to be a bit floral and, and they often have a little bit of residual sugar in them, but they're not proper sweet dessert wines. Um, Chenin Blanc from, um, from the Loire, when it's dry, can be really steely and very inexpressive when it's very, very young. Um, Whereas you can also make Chenin Blanc into a very late harvest sweet um, styles uh, that age for decades and decades. They're absolutely crazy. Um, Craig, Chenin that starts to erode. Yeah, the acid and the, and it's like Chenin's very apple as well. It has a real kind of green apple um, character when it's kind of young and fresh and dry. Uh, an older or a, a sweeter style will tend to develop into, um, yes, Vouvray is made from Chenin Blanc, absolutely. Um, so Vouvray is the uh, town where it's grown and Chenin Blanc is the grape variety that is allowed to be grown and made into wine there. Um, Cotty, going back to something I said earlier with this wine, saying uh, that uh, you thought that wine becomes less fruity as it ages. It usually does. Um, I think that with this I think with this wine, um, it was so tightly wound as a really young wine. Um, it has taken a few years for it to sort of loosen up and open. It's like a um, like a rosebud opening up and unfurling its petals. Um, you can't see a rose until it's fully unfurled, and I think this wine, in a similar way, you can't see, you can't smell the the fruit aromas properly until it's had time to evolve and change and, and age in the bottle. Probably doesn't have to be 10 years. I would say this wine was um, evolving and changing from about three or four years of age, but it's because it's under screw cap, because of the quality of the fruit, because of the balance of the wine, um, it's just aging much more slowly than people expected that it would, which I think is pretty awesome. Now, what's Jeff said, subtle fruit, savouriness that blends with salami and triple green brie, match made in heaven. Absolutely. Um, oh, that sound, actually sounded like um, 
that sounded a little bit like Sue. So I'm wondering if Sue's maybe doing some typing now. But I agree with you on that. Um, Sonia, hello. Nice to see you again. Um, enjoying it with mussels in a creamy sauce. That would be delicious. Uh, it, yeah, I think um, it would work beautifully with mussels, even if you just cooked your mussels in some white wine and some garlic and had them with some um, with some pommes frites. That would be rather delicious as well. But with a creamy sauce, even better. Okay, carbonara is okay with it, but isn't a great carbonara. Not enough punch in the cheese, nor enough fat, as mentioned. Pre-made, yeah. I think the problem with pre-made carbonara, okay, as well, is that often they'll put a bit of cream in it to make it creamy, whereas if you make it from fresh, um, if you make it from fresh, then um, you don't need to use cream. You just use the hot pasta and a little bit of the pasta water to melt the cheese and cook the cook the egg that you kind of stir in right at the very last minute and that gives it that creaminess. And, and I think that um, I think a, a great, homemade carbonara like that also like that recipe that I sent you which is basically carbonara without the bacon in it um and with uh sheep's cheese instead of um parmesan but very similar to carbonara um very uh I think that kind of very quick putting it together but it being super fresh and being made from scratch um makes a huge difference to those sort of dishes um Craig can we get on to the Prosecco argument uh, which Prosecco argument are we going to be talking about, Craig? <laughs> Hello, Samantha. Lovely to see you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Jeff's in charge of comments tonight. Good on you. Good on you, Jeff. Um, yeah, okay. Give, give, it, give it a crack with um, freshly made um, carbonara when you've got the time and the energy and, the, and, and, the, and you can be bothered. <laughs> It's one of those things you've got to be in the right mood to make it, right? And then you've got to be ready to eat it as soon as it comes off the off the heat. Um, Craig, the Prosecco argument, are you talking about the uh, all the discussion that's been talked about with Prosecco um, in Victoria uh, recently? Because I actually did put in a, a little um, – Paul doesn't think it smells of durian. I don't think – Samantha, I think I kind of went down the wrong path there. Um, I think there's just this little tiny subtle hint of something that isn't quite fruit and isn't quite meaty, isn't quite earthy, isn't quite. I was just trying to think what it was that it reminded me of, and I came up with durian, but I don't think that's right either. So I'll 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 um I'll go back and edit that out of this conversation when we've finished. <laughs> Does anything got you thinking of prosecco, Craig? Um, so I think what Craig's talking about. And please tell me that I'm wrong if I'm going down the wrong path. Last week's chicken, French chicken would absolutely go with this, Jackie. Um, the European Union is putting forward some new rules about what we agree to call different wines. Um, they're all about um, wines from Europe that are named um, for a region. Usually it's a grape variety and a region. Sometimes the sometimes the name um, of the region will be the name of the wine, like Vouvray, which is what Craig was um, uh, alluding to, that, you know, unless you learn that Vouvray as a region grows Chenin Blanc, then it's hard to understand how that all works. But the European U Union is trying to um, make sure that those place names that wines are related to um, don't get appropriated by the new world, basically, and, the, and that those are, that they're unique to them. The most obvious one um, is champagne, and we agreed back in the eighties, I think, it, Australia, that we would not call um, that we would not call our sparkling wine champagne because it doesn't come from the region of Champagne. I think that's reasonable. Um, there've been some other things that have gone on, and it's not just wine. Uh, we have cheese. Um, appellations that we're that we're not allowed to name our cheeses after like rock for uh that kind of thing and but the most recent one and this has been going on in the um european courts for quite a long time this is the fourth or fifth time that the italians have tried to get it through but i think that australia is quite worried that um they've got it that they've possibly got it through now and the european union is is um backing um italy on this the reason that it's a problem is because Prosecco, the name, 
um, until maybe the last couple of decades, Prosecco was the name of the grape variety that was grown and made into <laughs> a Peter, thank you. Peter, I'm giving you a lecture now. Pipe down. No, <laughs> I'll do it quickly. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute, Anne. Um, it's all, it's, uh, well, I can answer that very quickly. It's all down to trade agreements. The French can't, um, can't arrest anyone for calling their wine champagne here, but Australia has signed trade agreements. And so it's agreed that we won't use champagne for our sparkling wine. And if you want to um, sell your wine uh, overseas, definitely you can't export it. Um, but also it's frowned upon by the, governing bodies like Wine Australia that anyone would use champagne. And, and there's been a big education program and we're very happy talking about Australian sparkling wine now generally, um, educated wine people anyway. You still go to, I still go to weddings where people say, would you like a glass of champagne? I'm like, I'd love one, but I bet you don't have one for me because <laughs> um, I'm a smart ass. Uh, but back to Prosecco, which we're not drinking, we're drinking Pinot Gris. Have another glass of Pinot Gris while I tell you about, about Prosecco. The problem with Prosecco is that it's the great, it originally was the name of the grape variety. The Italians always called the grape variety Prosecco, made it into sparkling wine in um, a couple of uh, parts of the Veneto in Italy. Now, that grape variety was then exported to uh, other places, including Australia, and um, the Chalmers in Mildura brought that grape variety in as Prosecco and were selling it to people to grow in um, Australia. And there's quite a lot of Italians who um, second third generation Italians who wanted to make that style of wine from that grape variety that was, um, you know, uh, from their homeland. So they bought the grape variety, planted it, made sparkling wine using the method that they use for making Prosecco in Italy. And Italy went, oh, hang on, they're making some really good Australian Prosecco. We need to protect the name. So they changed the name of the grape variety from Prosecco to Glera. And they're trying to argue that the region is called Prosecco. The region has never been called Prosecco. Um, the, the two DOCGs are Prosecco di Valdobbiadane, um, blah, 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 Berodinga. I can't remember. How, it's, it's, a, it's a village on top of a hill and there's, and there's one other. But they make Prosecco now all through the Veneto and Prosecco is taking over um, grape growing uh, winemaking land that was previously um, Pinot Gris, um, planted to Pinot Gris, or even worse, planted to Valpolicella varieties in Valpolicella or um, uh, Suave varieties in around the village of Suave. So it's, it's a bit of a nonsense, but the Italians have managed to convince the EU that they should have the name Prosecco as a place name that um, describes their wine. And Australian producers who've invested a lot of money into planting these grapes and making this um, wine in this style and have worked quite hard on marketing Australian Prosecco uh, feel that they're being cheated out of um, something that they're trying to do with with a lot of respect and with sort of a hats off to the Italian style and saying, well, you know, we respect the Italian style. We want to make that style of wine here from the Prosecco grape variety. And uh, we're the, so this is why there's a big fuss going on. They're also sort of um, extrapolating that and saying, well, you know, if you weren't not going to be able to call um, a wine Prosecco in Australia, how long is it going to be before the EU, someone tries to say you can't use um Chardonnay or Pinot Noir as a because they'll say, oh, there's a village called Chardonnay in Burgundy, which there is. But I think they're going to have trouble getting away with that because Chardonnay is grown all over the world. Pinot Noir is grown all over the world. Um, I think that would be much more difficult because Prosecco is grown in Veneto and is grown in mostly Victoria. Um, and But these Victorian producers have made a, put a lot of work into trying to build up that um, the Brown Brothers, Del Zotto family um, uh, are two of the most sort of um, outspoken of all of the, the Prosecco producers. But it's a real shame, actually, because there's a lot of really cheap, nasty Prosecco coming out of Italy that will still be allowed to be called Prosecco. If this goes through, 
and really high quality Australian Prosecco won't be able to use the name and they're actually flying the flag for quality Prosecco wine much more than a lot of the Italian, cheaper, nastier Italian versions. So that's the argument. I put in a little, a little, um, I wrote a little thing to uh, the government to give them my, um, give them my feedback. And Pete's asking what else would you call it in Australia and that's the big problem. Um, we, there wouldn't be a name for it. Um, sparkling Galera sounds horrendous because Galera is the new name that they've given to the grape variety now that they're trying to say that Prosecco is the region. Um, they can't make Mornington Plonk. No, that's right, Craig. Um, and, uh, you know, on a personal level, I, I don't really care because I'm not interested in growing Prosecco or making Prosecco um, where I am, but I feel really sad for um, people who put a lot of work into it under the impression that they were doing the right thing by the grape variety and by the wine style and all of those kind of things. Now they're getting smacked in the face by the Italians. Um, so, Pete, really all you could call it would be sparkling sparkling wine, sparkly bubbly. Yes, that sounds like something that um, that uh, Sammy J would say, Pete. <laughs> I think Sammy J was talking about it before. Um, bubbles. Oh, well, well, hi, Richard. <laughs> Have you been trying to make this work all this time? Hello, mum and dad. <laughs> Sorry that nobody got you set up with the tech before everyone went home. <laughs> Subtly bubbly. Yeah, the problem is that um, people understand Prosecco is incredibly, Prosecco is a brand name for that style of wine, which is made differently from Champagne and, and Method Traditionnel sparkling wines. So, um, yeah, Pizzini, thank you, Jeff. That was the other name that I was trying to think of. Yeah, I think that, I mean, Prosecco, that's that's pretty good, Jackie, actually. Um, not bad. They'll come, if they if they if it happens, they'll come up with something. Um, hopefully it'll be better than the names that we came up with to replace Toke and um, Sherry. <laughs> Craig, Craig, we have to get you down to Maruduck to give Richard tech support. Tech support. <laughs> pr 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 yeah, I don't understand, Peter. <laughs> I think maybe you've had one too many glasses of Pinot Gris now. Um, but this wine is still opening up really nicely in the glass. So, oh, my God. Yes, thank you. Oh, okay, got, got it, Pete. Thank you. <laughs> mm. um, the wine's opening up beautifully in the glass. I'm going to put a little bit more in my glass because... Um, Mine's got a little bit warm and it's a little plastic cup. I've got to say, I don't love drinking out of plastic, but these are pretty good. They're, they're not too plasticky and, um, yeah, as I say, much nicer than any of the glasses that I had here in my hotel. So going well with cheesy zucchini slice. It would be beautiful with cheesy zucchini slice, Samantha. Peter, I should have got your cheesy zucchini slice recipe. We might do that for another Pinot Gris one of these, one of these days. I do think if you ever feel like having a bit of a meat-free day and you're happy to have a bit of cheese and maybe a bit of um, bit of egg in your meat-free meal, then uh, Nina's recipe. Um, ah, Tegan and Ehu. Tegan, lovely to see you. I totally, totally missed. So today has been a little bit of a day. I've... Um, I had to come to Sydney for this teaching that I'm doing for the next couple of days and I booked my flight for like four o'clock thinking oh, it'll be great because Tegan and um, her partner Sam were coming to Muraduck for lunch. Now anyone who anyone who's out there who maybe came to Jill's restaurant about how long ago was it Tegan? About 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> Uh, maybe not quite that long ago, but Tegan was one of one of the waitresses at Jill. She was one of our key staff members, um, and she now lives. You're with Richard. Ah, oh, I'm so confused. <laughs> oh, you're with Richard. <laughs> Computer things very confusing. Twenty years ago, nearly. I know, crazy, crazy. So Tegan worked at Maruduck and um, she now lives in London and works at the London Zoo and um, looks after the animals there, which is amazing. Um, and every now and again, you know, I, I got I got it, um, Tegan, you agree with Richard. Peter, the Peter also got confused. So I also got, yeah, anyway, whatever. Um, 
So Teeing doesn't get back to Australia very very often, and she was back. She's back in Australia at the moment, visiting friends, and she came to Muraduck for lunch today. And because I had forgotten about drinks with Kate, and I would have been on an aeroplane when I was supposed to be doing drinks with Kate, I had to change my flight to miss lunch at Muraduck. So I miss Tegan and Sam and Tegan's dad, so that I could get to Sydney in time to do drinks with Kate with you guys. That's how special you are. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to catch up, Tegan, with you guys in London when I'm there in um, late June, early July. So I will send you my dates. And it sounds like you had a a lovely um, lunch even without me. So (laughs) cheers. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, mm. And you're having some Meredith's goat cheese. Awesome. I think the Meredith's goat cheese is a really good match to this wine. Tegan didn't get a choice. I just thought, you know what, it's going to be too hard and it was, it just, yeah, I can't be everywhere all at once. So I'm hoping that, oh, croaks. <laughs> oh, Peter, you're very naughty. Um, so anyway, yes, it's uh, it's lovely to have you on board, Tegan, and um, I'm glad you're enjoying the wine. Uh, so where are we up to? Uh, we're up to 40 minutes already. Goodness gracious me. Um how people how's people's wine going? Have you finished it all or are you still going? Is it opening up still? I'm gonna have what am I gonna have? I'm gonna have a little chip, I'm gonna have a little potato chip because I do still think that a nicely salted, high quality potato chip is a very good match to most white wines. Mm. So next week. We have a different wine. Move on to Quince Paste Made Today. Oh, my God, Sam. <laughs> that is, that's hardcore. I've never made Quince Paste because it just seems like too much stirring. So um, well done. I hope it goes beautifully with the wine. Um, we are now moving away from 2013 next week and we have a Pinot Noir from 2018. And we're getting to the end of our box uh, of of, um, Drinks with Kate wines for box two. So uh, this is wine four. Um, We've got two more wines to go. Paul's banned you from making it again. (laughs) That sounds a little bit like when Jill and um, and the team and I at Muraduck decided to um, make salami with our Italian friends. Um, Oh, (laughs) Noreen, you have to save some wine for Keely. Um, that said, you guys are coming to um, lunch on Sunday, so you'll get to taste it again with our favourite cheese with this wine. So um, this Sunday we're going to be looking at a whole lot of different vintages of Pinot Gris. So if too much Pinot Gris is never enough for you, um, I'm looking forward to seeing those of you who are able to make it to, to lunch on Sunday. Um, we have, yes, so I agree, Craig, it's a great, It's a really great alternative to Chardonnay. It's done a beautiful job of ageing. It is still available to buy for you guys. Um, I can send you a little link. Um, And, in fact, what I'll do, because I know for a lot of you um, the Sunday um, date didn't really work, so um, after the lunch I'll send out the... um, I'll send out the order form to my drinks with Kate friends, um, so that if the, if you want to buy a few little back vintage Pinot Gris, then um, you can still access them. Uh, we don't have huge amounts of all of the wines that we're serving on Sunday, but what we can offer, we will. Um, and the, and the McCanns, woo! <laughs> so I am going to leave you there. I don't think the one thing I didn't do um, while we were talking about this because we got straight into the tasting note for this wine. Um, I didn't talk, for those of you who haven't been on the 2013 journey with us for the last three weeks, I didn't talk about the vintage, but but just a very quick summary. It was quite a warm vintage, and I think that's why we've got so much richness and and depth of flavour in this wine. Um, And the textural quality is really important because it's quite low in acid. Um, the other thing I didn't talk about is how we make Pinot Gris at Muradak because I feel like I've said, um, I've talked to a lot of you about that in the past, but I do think that, um, Sonia, send me an email, um, kate at muradakestate.com.au 
and I will get you on the mailing list because everyone who's in Drinks with Kate should also be part of our wine club and it's something that we're reviewing and revamping and we'll have working hopefully perfectly within the next few months. But in the meantime, there are a few people who uh, seem to be missing out on their emails and if anybody else besides Sonia is also on that list, please email me um, and just say, Kate, I'm not getting wine club um, uh, lunch um, emails. Um, have you, Sonia, did you, have you sent kate at muradakestate.com.au? I'll write myself a note because I know that we've got your details somewhere. I think we've probably got your email um, address written down incorrectly, something like that. But if you emailed me directly um, at kate, kate at muradakestate.com.au and make sure that you get all the O's in there um, for Muradak. Um, I promise I'll get you sorted out. I haven't received any of your emails if you've been emailing me personally, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. But, um, uh, but the, your other option, if you, yeah, well, look, Peter and I will look into it. We'll set it out. Um, I check my junk all the time, Jackie, <laughs> but I'll check again. Um, we'll get it sorted out, Sonia. Peter, can you write a note that we need to sort Sonia out? <laughs> Pronto. <laughs> um, Yes, okay, so, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, wine making, same as the way we make our Chardonnay, so very simple, um, pick, hand pick the grapes, squash the grapes with the press, um, the juice gets oxidised as it's going into, as it's getting, as it's coming out of the, um, coming out of the tank, um, it is a little bit white chocolatey now, I did see that. Shell, I was just, I was getting, I was um, upset because Sonia's having trouble getting through to us. Um, ah, maybe, maybe, yeah. So, oh, yes, yeah, Sonia, have a look. Do check your junk mail and see that we, we haven't um, we haven't disappeared into your junk mail. Um, but, yes, very simple winemaking. Um, juice into barrel. The wine has a natural ferment. We top the barrels up when they're finished. We let them sit unsulfured for eight, nine months. They go through a spontaneous malolactic conversion, which a lot of people say malolactic conversion for Pinot Gris. That's crazy, but I think it's important for the style of the wine and I think it's important for the ageability of the wine, the balance of the wine. Um, and then it, we give it a little bit of sulfur when we're getting it ready for bottling. So it's very, very simple um, hands-off kind of winemaking. The, um, the, 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 the tricky bits are making sure that we pick it at the right time and that it's got the right balance of flavour and acid and sugar and all of the thing, pH, all the things that need to be right so that we don't need to do too much to it to let it turn into beautiful wine. Um, I have also loved this little journey of 2013's Alison and Noreen. Thank you very much for coming on the 2013 journey with me, team. Um, I'm working on box three as we speak and I should have an email out to you uh, early next week with um, with the offer on box three and also um, Pinot Gris uh, generally. Um, so that'll be something to look out for in the, in your mailbox uh, early next week. Um, next Thursday we are doing... Um, we are doing uh, 2018 Muradaka State Pinot Noir, um, which will be awesome. And Peter has made a comment, which would not be boring or obvious at all, Pete. You know, we don't have any of those on this on this chat. The wine on its own seemed quite sweet, but with some warnable cheddar and pear, it seemed quite minerally. Thank you, Nina. Um, I think when you say sweet, it had a richness and a and a, and a um, kind of almost confectionery kind of aromatic to it, but no sugar. And this is why when you put it with savoury food, and if you use a little bit of quince paste as well, the wine tastes quite minerally and savoury because it doesn't have any sugar in it. So you lose that. You you realise your taste buds realise that it's not sweet. It's just got quite a lot of alcohol and quite a lot of glycerol and texture, but it's also got that really kind of um, almost cooked tropical fruit, um, uh, slightly caramelised sugar kind of aromatic to it, which confuses your brain into thinking you're drinking something sweet. Anyway, I think that's probably a pretty good place to finish. Um, it's been awesome, everyone. 
Thank you for all your questions and your comments. I'm glad you've enjoyed this one. Um, Sonia, I'm going to get you sorted out. Uh, it's been awesome to see you all. Thank you so much. The, the texture does last really well, Craig. It does. It, it really kind of copes with all sorts of food. So um, go out and sort of trial this wine with uh, with different flavours. It's great with yum cha too. Um, good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, Anne. Kay, it's been an awesome 2013 journey. We might see if we can find another vintage to go for a little exploring for the next box. Um, watch this space and I'll see you all again next week. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>